The Tao of Self-Confidence, Episode 834. Welcome to the Tao of Self-Confidence, where I share stories of amazing women who have discovered their inner journey to self-confidence. Visit our website at thetaoofselfconfidence.com. Your inner journey to self-confidence awaits. Well, hello, friend. Welcome to the Tao of Self-Confidence, where I share stories of amazing women who have discovered their inner journey to self-confidence. I'm your host today, Sheena Yapchan, and today I have such an amazing woman here today. I'm so honored to have her as a guest. She wears many different hats under her sleeve. You know, she's an award-winning journalist. She is also the host of The May Lee Show. She's also known as Forbes is 50 over 50. And I'm just honored to have her on today to share her story with us. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to May Lee. May, how are you today? Maybe you can fill in a little bit more about yourself to the listeners. Yeah. Hi, Sheena. It's so wonderful to be on your show. Thanks for having me. And that intro was great. Yes, I do wear many hats. And the older I get, I seem to collect even more hats. So <laughs> it's, it's becoming kind of limitless at this point. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. And May, what's your cultural background? So I am the daughter of Korean immigrants. They came here in the uh, mid 60s from Korea, both of them as adults. And then I was actually born in the US in Ohio. We actually moved back to Korea when I was only barely two years old. And we lived in Korea for a few more years. And then we moved back again to the US. So kind of did the little back and forth when I was very, very young. Thanks for sharing that. And May, what's your favorite self-confidence quote? I think one of my favorites, I have several, but one of my favorites is be fearless. And the reason why I adopted that as an adult is because when I was a kid, I, I think I had a lot of fear for a variety of reasons. One being that I was one of very few Asian kids growing up in Ohio, my brother being the only other Asian kid. So because of that, as a lot of us know who are minorities, we are made to feel less than or otherized, made to feel like they're perpetual foreigners. So I think because of that, I had a lot of fear as a little girl girl, not wanting to speak up, not wanting to make any waves, no noise. And of course, being bullied. As I grew up and as I matured and I, as I grew more confident, obviously, as a journalist, certainly we have to be pretty confident in, in doing stories and going into dangerous situations. I became more fearless. It was sort of an evolutionary process. So that's one motto that I like to live by. Thanks for sharing that. And I love that, especially as Asian women, we've always been told to follow what our parents tell us to do, never rock the boat, never make any noise. And because of that, we're so scared to even just take that first step to forge our own path. And, you know, like you growing up with no representation, it was really hard for me to embrace being Asian, you know, instead of yeah. I wanted to be a blonde haired blue eyed girl named Heather, because that's what I thought being beautiful at the time was. Isn't that funny? I wanted to be a blonde haired blue eyed girl named Mary. <laughs> so very, isn't it interesting? We all have such similar experiences growing up in a world where we, we certainly were made to feel, again, not accepted in the way we looked and the way we sounded and in our culture and our background. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's so much, I've met so many women of color who mentioned, you know, they also had a Caucasian girl name or, you know, alias, because that's all they ever saw in the media back then. So, you know, it's a lot more common than we realize. It's just nobody talks about it until now. So I really love that you mentioned that. And in your own words, how do you define self-confidence? So I think self-confidence initially comes from being comfortable in your own skin. And the reason why I say that is because in our society to this very day, we're, we're so judgmental when it comes to someone's physical appearance. It's all about beauty and youth and what you're dressed like, what you look like, what your body is like. And so many young people, especially young women and even older women to this day, get so affected by that pressure. And so once you get comfortable in your own skin, in your own body and exude that feeling of, I accept myself for what I look like and what my appearance is like, I don't really care what you think. That is a level of self-confidence that I think is unbeatable. It took me a long time to get close to that point. I'm not certainly not suggesting I'm 100% there because again, I think we all feel that pressure almost on a daily basis, especially in this day and age with social media, right? And we see these images everywhere. It's no longer just in uh, magazines and commercials, right? But I have gotten to a place 
where I can now stop myself from questioning, you know, oh my gosh, am I thin enough or am I young enough? You know, I can't do that anymore anyway. I'm in my 50s. So that I feel like I'm getting more comfortable with the idea of being comfortable in my own skin. And that really helps overall, doesn't it? Because then you feel comfortable, you know, saying what you want to say and feeling the way you want to feel and doing what you want to do and not falling under the pressures of what everybody else wants for you or from you. Right. So, so that, that I think first and foremost is, is how I feel about beginnings of ultimate self-confidence. I love it. And I know, especially in Asia, right? I mean, beauty is such a huge industry. I mean, skin whitening creams alone or products, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And we see it everywhere in Asia. If you're not white enough, you're not considered beautiful. Plastic surgery too is like everywhere, you know, especially uh, in Chinese culture, one of the things they do, one of the things they love to do is having a line on their eyelids because they want to look more westernized in- instead of having smaller eyes. Yeah, the double eyelid surgery. Yeah, that's been around forever. Same with Korea. And, and that's kind of a, a thing, another sign of beauty. But yeah, no, I think beauty is something that is so, so sort of revered all around the world, of course. But unfortunately, the standards of beauty were set a long time ago, saying that Western standards of beauty were the ultimate goal. So skin whitening, but also just, you know, the bigger eyes, the cheek implants, the taller nose, all of these things, even height, right? Even there's extreme surgeries in Asia where your legs can be lengthened, but it is an unbelievably grotesque surgery. And I've seen documentaries on it and I cannot believe that women actually go through that. Oh my gosh, I don't know if I can, I can stomach that. No, you couldn't. I actually, it's, it's very hard to stomach when you actually see what the procedure entails. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much for sharing that. And May, what was your life like before you discovered self-confidence? Well, I think it, I was very much of an introvert, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe now, given you know what my life is like now and, and the career path I chose. But yeah, again, going back to what I said, my introverted nature came from my environment. You know, came from not having that self confidence due to the fact that I felt like I didn't belong and I struggled to belong. So, therefore, the way I could belong was to kind of stay more quiet and not stick out like a sore thumb, right? The few times I did, I remember one story uh, that really is it's, it's such a vivid memory from when I was only, I think, probably seven years old or eight years old. I was in a ballet class, and of course, all the other students were white. And the ballet instructor was an older white woman. And I was pretty good at the time. I was a pretty good ballerina. I had some talent. And I remember doing the routine quite well compared to the other kids. And the instructor said, you know what? You, 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 You have to stop sticking out so much and doing the routine this way. So, you know, she meant you're too good compared to the other girls. So you need to tone it down. And I still remember that to this day, because even at that young age, I was taught that very horrible lesson of you better, you better kind of just blend in, especially since you're different, you need to blend in even more. So that, that really does affect a child's psyche for a very long time. So I think because of that, I was introverted. I didn't talk much. I didn't, you know, want to make a lot of noise, but as I matured, as I then chose my profession of journalism, clearly I had to become this very sort of outspoken, confident, aggressive at times person. It's worked for me. You know, again, I'm in my 50s, so I'm certainly not going to change now. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that. I think we have you know, all of us go through some form of traumatic experience in our childhood, right? I know when I was five, I failed kindergarten for coloring outside the lines. And that made me feel like I was a failure all my life, not realizing I was just meant to color outside the lines. I was never meant to be you know, doing things within the lines or what people were telling me to do. But, but, you know, schools nowadays don't talk about self-care, don't talk about self-development, you know, and if this was actually in our curriculum for our children, like, you know, they, we would live in a more different world, right? We would see things in different perspectives. There's no such thing as you failed science, therefore you're a failure, 
right? Because there's so many different ways to live our lives and we're all different people, right? Not one single person is the same. So of course, all of us will do different things. And I think if we just explored a little bit more of our kids, uh, the more we can understand them, the more we can really prepare them for the world versus like, you know, you have to go to college from kindergarten to, to, or school from kindergarten to college. And this is the only way that will help you make it in life. Honestly, there's a million other different ways, but but I wanted to know what was um, what was that point in your life where you realized you know you can go out there and you know be a journalist, especially you know as an Asian woman being a journalist. That's not easy, right? Uh, yeah. There's not a lot of representation, and sometimes it can feel very lonely. Like I remember starting my podcast, I, I could not find any Asian women podcasting, and I was like, maybe I'm the only one. But you know, I we all have to start somewhere. But what was that aha moment in your life? Well, I did have an aha moment and, and uh, it's actually kind of a, a divine story. So I was your typical Asian kid who thought I needed to be a doctor or a lawyer, because again, that's the programming that a lot of us have, right? Because uh, it was a safe career choice. But I struggled in math and science you know, throughout my entire schooling. But I thought, no, keep going, May. You can do it. You can do it if you try hard enough. So even when I entered college, I was, I considered myself pre-med, which is just so laughable when I think about it now. But anyway, so I struggled again, but I finally said to myself, this isn't working. I'm literally barking up the wrong tree here. So I, I need to figure something out. And I got very silent and I asked myself, what is it that you really love doing? And I love loved writing. I actually loved public speaking. I loved the visual media. I loved storytelling. And so, I, and I also was a very curious person. And even as a child, I knew I had an extra level of curiosity. And so all of a sudden I heard a voice say to me very clearly, you need to be a broadcast journalist. And so I, I say it was divine because I truly believe it was like the voice of God for me. And it was so clear that I didn't even question it. And the odd thing is that I never had even thought about being a journalist before. So that wasn't something I was mulling over before. So it was very clear. And so from that moment, I switched my major to communications and I started pursuing this career, getting internships during college and things like that. And the rest is history. But this is all I've ever done. I've never had another career. I love it. And I love that you mentioned, you know, the moment you got that clarity, you went for it. And th that takes a lot of confidence and courage to go out there and even just start that journey because we've been programmed to always have something stable, stable income, stable family, stable life. And so embracing the unknown is very scary for, for most of us, right? Because we We've never been taught like that. And so I really love that you just went for it. You knew it and you just went for it regardless of the circumstances. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you the pushback that I got, my parents did not like the idea, of course, you know, to Korean immigrant parents, you know, my father was a doctor, so very conservative. They did not have any understanding of wanting to go into broadcast journalism. They thought it was very risky for an Asian. And then on top of that, an Asian woman to go into. And they were right. They were actually right. It was very risky because there weren't many of us back then that, that were in the business. Uh, so I got a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance. So thank you for acknowledging that, Sheena. It did take some guts, but I obviously had such clarity. It was so unquestionable that this was the path I was supposed to take. So I had to. I had no choice. I love it. And thank you so much for sharing that story. I hope the listeners will un will be able to be inspired to do the same thing as well. And, you know, because of that, what's your life been like now? Because of that choice? Well, it's been exciting. That's for sure. <laughs> the thing about being a journalist, of course, is that you're given license to go anywhere pretty much and find a story and talk to people. And they're mostly willing to talk to you when you say you're a journalist. Uh, for some reason, they open up to you even if you're a complete, perfect stranger. And so that's taken my life all over the world, quite literally. I've lived in Tokyo and Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, New York, uh, San Francisco, LA, and then of course, traveled to about 55 countries. Some for fun, of course, but a lot of it for work as well. So it's really exposed me to things that the average person will never get to experience. They will never get to meet the people that I've met. They they will never go to the places that I've been to. And of course, as a journalist, I have seen 
every aspect of life, every disaster, man-made and mother nature, and seeing the good side and the bad side of humanity. But that's what I thrive on is to be able to tell stories that aren't being told or give voice to those who are voiceless. And then to educate the public, you know, journalism should really be about information. And then it's up to the viewer or the reader to decide what their stance is on something or their position. But unfortunately, you know, journalism has changed quite a bit since I started in this business and it's, it's pretty divided. It's causing a lot of conflict and there's a lot of misinformation as we know. And that's what's leading to all the things that we're seeing right now, particularly in politics. So it's a, it's a, it's an industry and a business that has probably changed more dramatically than any other, at least from what I can see myself. I can't believe that this is the same industry that I got into over 30 years ago. It's dramatically different. Thanks for sharing that. And May, you know, to the woman who's listening to her episode, she may be in her own journey to self-confidence. What would be that one tip you would give to her? I would say, don't doubt yourself. I stopped questioning my gut many years ago. And I had to really train myself to do that because we have an instinct. Everyone does, but I think women especially have a very special instinct that tells us, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what to do, what not to do. And you can call it instinct, you can call it your gut, you know, whatever you want to call it. But we do have this special power in all of us. We just have to be in tune with it and listen to it But oftentimes when you're younger, you don't go with your gut, right? You say, "Eh, no, that's not right. I'm going to do this. And 10 times out of 10, and I'm not even, it's not even nine times, 10 times out of 10, your gut was always right. So I finally said to myself many years ago, okay, May, don't ever doubt your gut. Don't ever go against your instinct and you will be okay. Well, guess what? About a month ago, I went against my instinct about this decision I made. And I was wrong. Of course, I was wrong. And I got taught this lesson one more time in my 50s. And I literally got so mad at myself. I'm like, I cannot believe you went against your own rule. But so I would, that's, that would be the lesson that I would share with, with uh, women and young women, especially. Your gut is very powerful. Your instinct is very powerful. So, Sure, you can question it, but sit there and really like ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? What, what's this telling me? And you will know because it's, it's never wrong. I love that advice. And I know I've, I've gone against my gut way more than I could <laughs> count. And, you know, it's always, it was always like a hot mess. And I realized like, we just have to go with our gut and, you know, not expect anything. And I know sometimes we trust ourselves and then we picture something that's totally the opposite, right? And we think, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. But, you know, everything falls into place. And when you look back, you're like, I'm glad I went, you know, trusted my gut. I, I didn't doubt myself because yes, we all go through moments of doubt because we're not robots, we're human, right? But it's sometimes having the tools, having the support to ensure us that we have what it takes. Women, especially Asian women, are so capable to do amazing things when they have the com- confidence and courage to do it. And sometimes we have to realize we don't even have to do it alone. That's why we create shows like this, like your show, you know, you sharing stories, me creating, you know, interviewing all these Asian women so that we have that support. So when we feel lonely, we can listen to someone's story and be like, you know what, I can relate to that person. And if she's able to come out of it, then I can come out of it as well. So. Yeah, I think it's important to share as much as you can. I mean, I'm certainly not saying share your deepest, darkest, darkest secrets to, you know, a stranger, but I think oftentimes, again, in Asian culture, particularly, we're programmed to keep everything in. We have to internalize everything, show no emotion and tough it out, which there is a positive side to that sometimes, you know, it does make us tougher and stronger. But I think the lack of sharing in stories and experiences so that we do feel connected and that we do, don't feel so alone, like as if we're the only ones going through this problem or this issue. I think there's, very power, there's such power in that. And it's like Brene Brown, who I, I do love because she does such incredible work and research and vulnerability. She you know, says vulnerability is actually a power. 
if you can be more vulnerable, then you can discover more of yourself and also connect with others who share in that vulnerability. And so I think with Asians overall, men, women, young, old, we should try to be much more so in that embracing of vulnerability and being more open about our experiences and also asking, you know, others, especially our elders. I teach my students in graduate school, I teach an Asian American history and journalism class. And I tell them, you need to talk to your parents and your grandparents and whoever is still alive and get their stories because you will be sorry when they're gone and you never ask them about their, their life. And so I gave them an assignment to do so. And they came back with the most incredible stories that they're like, you know what? I realized I never spoke to my mother about how she escaped Vietnam. I never spoke to my grandmother about what it was like, you know, during the Cultural Revolution. So it's really fascinating when people realize, yeah, you know what? I think I need to talk to people more and open up myself. No, I totally agree. I know I, I asked my grandmas, you know, stories of themselves when they had to grow up in the Philippines and what they had to go through. Like my gr- one grandma, it was the oldest of 11, 12 children, you know, so she had to be the the household, like doing everything for them. Right. And yeah. just learning to just appreciate more and what she's done for us to give us a better life. So I really love that you mentioned that. And May, if our listeners wanted to get to know a little bit more about you, check out your show. Is there any links or social media profiles we can connect with? Yeah, so many. Um, so the show is bo- is a vodcast. So it's in both video and a podcast form. So the video version of the show is on YouTube to search for The May Lee Show. And then the podcast version, of course, is available on all major podcast platforms. So again, it's The May Lee Show. I'm pretty active on social media. So on Instagram, again, The May Lee Show, Facebook, same thing, Twitter, not as much. And then TikTok, man, I'm still trying to understand the whole thing about TikTok. I've posted a couple of videos, but I people are prolific on that platform, right? They're like posting it several times a day. I can't keep up with the young folks. So not so much on TikTok. But yeah, so you know, I, I try to get the message out in any way I can in what I'm doing. But juggling that and then being an adjunct professor at USC, and I'm also in the middle of writing an academic book, I feel like I have a lot on my plate these days. <laughs> so <laughs> here's the other lesson. As you get older, you're supposed to know how to prioritize and not say yes to everything. I'm still trying to teach myself that lesson. Yeah, I, I got to say no once in a while. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And to our listeners, if you want to connect with me, you can also head on over to the Tao of selfconfidence.com and search for May's name. Her show notes will pop up along with everything else that we talked about. And I really just want to thank May today for taking the time to share her story and tips with us on self-confidence. So May, thank you so much for being on the show today. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Sheena, and the work that you're doing to empower others. Thank you. And it was such an honor having you on the show today. And to our listeners, be on the lookout for another new episode of Another Amazing Woman's Journey to Self-Confidence, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of The Tao of Self-Confidence. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to get your daily boost of confidence.